investments made today in an oil field that are going to pay off over 40 or 50 years might not pay off because no one might want that oil in 2050 or 2060. And so we have to think about the investments we're making today that have a sufficiently long time horizon with an eye to what the future is going to bring in terms of environmental policy, environmental prices, and the use of different sources of fuel. Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of Wharton faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. We'll be covering a diverse range of topics, bringing you the latest insights and knowledge that you can apply to your life and to work. So get ready to dive into new ideas with The Ripple Effect. Let's start with just kind of ESG as the concept and the framework, because it's obviously been a topic that's been talked about a lot, especially in the last few years. Why, I guess, ESG when we're talking about all of these components? Obviously, there is the E, the S, and the G, but what is it that has drawn the... Uh, the the want for the connection to this terminology? Uh, Well, let's make sure all the um, listeners know what ESG actually stands for. E is for environment, S for social, G for governance. And the collection of them is the set of environmental, social, and governance factors uh, that influence materially by the SEC definition, there are things investors should care about, that materially influence a firm's revenues, costs, or efficiencies, and should be incorporated into financial models, into investment valuation, uh, into strategic um, assessments, but are often left out. Uh, They're often not incorporated. They're often not addressed. uh, They're often taken for granted. And the whole ESG movement is about putting them in. So obviously, this has been uh, very much an important component of your research. What was it that drew you Uh, to looking at ESG and and climate risk in the first place? Well, for 25 years, I've been working, I guess, in the S dimension and continue to still do a lot of my work there. I look at political and social risk management. Uh, So I've looked at how stakeholder engagement by firms, uh, managing the relationship with government officials, with communities, with civil society organizations is really a key value driver. Uh, I did a lot of that work in the extractive space, oil, gas, mining, also heavy manufacturing like semiconductors or pharmaceuticals. You might have the formal rights to do something. You might have all the permits. You might have all the licenses. But if you don't have the support of all the external stakeholders, not just those in your value chain, not just suppliers and buyers, but those secondary stakeholders, the community, the government, civil society, you might get stopped in your tracks by protests, by strikes, Uh, Or you might operate for a while and then get sued. There might be a regulatory inquiry. You might get shut down. And and at one level, when you tell that story, it's really obvious. But because those costs are in the future and they're unknown, firms often don't manage them particularly well. Uh, They underinvest up front in the relationships that could help forestall certain risks. And so for a long time, I tried to make that argument clear. And I tried to work with alternative data because there isn't publicly available data that often helps uh, and help make the business case that more attention to political risk, to social issues was actually good business. And the ESG movement needed exactly the same thing, uh, an eye for a different approach to data and analysis and a way of making the link between these ESG factors and the P&L. So you talk about the business case for uh, addressing climate change, and that's obviously been a back and forth now uh, for for a little while. Make the financial case for addressing climate change at this point. Well, I think it's increasingly easy and straightforward. I mean, there are going to be assets that are literally underwater, uh, whether it's a real estate investment or, or whether it's a factory close to a port. Uh, Certain assets by 2030, 2040, if we don't do something about the four or five degree scenario we're on, uh, are going to be underwater. And and you should be incorporating that into your valuation models. We're probably and hopefully shifting away from a heavy dependence on fossil fuels uh, to more green uh, sources of energy, whether it be hydro, wind, solar. Investments made today in an oil field that's that are going to pay off over 40 or 50 years might not pay off because no one might want that oil in 2050 or 2060. Uh, Similarly, investments in, um, you know, that are counting on there being fossil fuel vehicles in 2050 or 2060 may or may not pay off depending on how fast we have the uptick of electric vehicles. And so 
we have to think about the investments we're making today that have a sufficiently long time horizon with an eye to what the future is going to bring in terms of environmental policy, environmental prices, and the use of different sources of fuel. And, and I guess part of the discussion really is about the path that a lot of corporations and their leadership are taking in this uh, in this space. Uh, one of the uh, cases that is really talked about a lot in terms of being a potential important uh, element in terms of moving this forward uh, is engine number one and, and them winning uh, seats on the board with Exxon Mobil. Now you were kind of around that. And I guess let's start by talking a little bit about how that all developed over the course of time. Well, engine number one began uh, and, and its core business model uh, is really focused on the idea of bringing ESG factors in. Uh, but most people first became aware of them because of their campaign to unseat uh, four board members of ExxonMobil. And they built a brilliant 78-page deck that analyzed the business case uh, for ExxonMobil doing more on the energy transition and highlighting that the company was actually destroying shareholder value uh, by not attending to the energy transition. They had forecasts for the future price of oil that were rosier than OPEC. They had forecasts for the future demand of electric vehicles that were more pessimistic than just about anybody in the world. And they were making investment decisions today accordingly. And that was leading to a massive waste of shareholder capital. Um, estimates of over $200 billion of shareholder value destroyed. Uh, there was also the question of Darren Woods's pay and the corporate governance of the company, the G factor. Uh, during the time that he destroyed $200 billion of shareholder value, he got $70 million of bonuses. Uh, is that good corporate governance? Does that make any sense? He also appointed to the board a series of executives who underperformed their industries when they were CEOs and had absolutely no energy sector experience. So no one on the board could give them any realistic or tangible advice on the energy transition and what to do about climate transition because none of them knew anything about the energy sector. Again, that's just bad corporate governance. So you put all that together and you've got a very strong case uh, that they needed more oversight and they needed more uh, awareness of the energy transition on the board. And engine number one mounted a campaign to do that. Uh, I became involved as an advisor uh, to engine number one on a different project, what they call the total value framework, uh, which I co-developed uh, together with a, a group uh, from a major consultancy to um, generalize the case, if you will, of ExxonMobil try to analyze which companies are destroying value uh, to stakeholders and think about when that might hit shareholder value. And we did that for the entire S&P 500, and now it's been extended to the Russell 1000. Uh, and that was a major research project uh, to really try to build a data set that would allow them to look not just at one company, but at a whole set of companies and make investment decisions and engagements accordingly. Uh, and uh, I continue to, to work with them on that project. But in the scope of, of this process that's played out now uh, for quite some time, uh, a lot of people talk about uh, that movement to win board seats by engine number one as really kind of a pivot moment. How so do you think that that, that is the case? Well, I think there are a couple of factors in play. I mean, when they first started, everybody kind of wrote them off. You own 0.02% of the stock. Who are you guys? You're going to unseat three board members? Really? And then it kind of gathered momentum. People were like, wait, wait a minute, this is credible. This is serious. Look at this analysis. And then there was a day where three of the four proposed board members were ousted. And I think the next morning, just about every board member in a publicly traded company anywhere in the world reading that newspaper article said, I don't want to be them. I want to keep my job. What am I missing? What do I need to understand about the hidden risks or the missed opportunities from ESG factors? I better get a report about those at the next board meeting. I want to make sure that I'm doing my job and I can stand up to this kind of attack. And I think that amplification of the message, not just the headlines, not just the fact that it was ExxonMobil, not just David versus Goliath, but the fact that every publicly traded company in the world's board is suddenly starting to talk about ESG factors at the next annual meeting. I think that was the biggest impact uh, that engine number one has had up to date. Well, then that puts an even greater focus on the data that is out there for each of these particular companies around ESG. And I guess the question is, how can we better use that data to move that needle forward? Uh, well, let's start with the current state uh, of the data that we have. Most of it, honestly, is quite bad. 
Uh, it's based on voluntary, unaudited disclosure by corporations. They either put stuff in their sustainability report or they answer these really long surveys that companies sell them. And then different companies sell us the data. Um, we're only getting a snapshot of what the company wants to share and what some third party data provider can kind of cobble together. And then the bigger problem, even if that data was accurate, there's like 100 factors, sometimes 300 factors. How do we weight them? How do we put them together? Because we've got you know performance measured in one set of units here and performance on another factor and a different set of units here and another factor. You know, should they be all equally weighted? Probably not. You know, Carbon emissions matters more for ExxonMobil than it does for, I don't know, Facebook. Teenage depression matters more for Facebook than it does for ExxonMobil. Uh, but how do we shift the weights and, and how do we turn tons of carbon and number of teenage girls in depression to dollar values that might hit shareholder value? Those are the questions the current ESG data sets don't answer and, and frankly need to be answered. So the total value framework was a big step towards doing that, but, but we've got a long way to go. Uh, we've got to really measure the impact that companies are having. Uh, and that's more akin to like impact uh, investment or impact valuation. But then we have to have a point of view about when those positive or negative impacts are going to hit shareholder value. Some firms, some cases, that's going to happen really quickly. That happened with ExxonMobil. Other cases, maybe Facebook, um, there's a more difficult pathway. There's more protection for the firm from these stakeholder forces. And, and it's harder to build a business case. Even though the firm is creating harm, it's harder to say that shareholders are going to bear the brunt in the short term. And so we really need to think through both of those. And very few ESG data sets allow us to do that. What kind of role do you think then that regulators will have to play in this process as we move forward? Well, we're starting to see greater requirements for disclosure of things like the emissions you release and also greater attention to your risk mitigation mechanisms. So what would happen to you if there was a four degree scenario? How many of your assets would be underwater? Or what would happen to you if we had a one and a half degree scenario, which means we have some kind of carbon tax or energy transition? Is your strategy robust to that? So this is a major and material risk for companies. And the SEC, under the current guidelines being discussed, they haven't been finally approved yet, is demanding that firms both report their emissions, but also undertake scenario analysis on different scenarios that uh, could occur in the future with respect to the climate transition. That's going to help investors, but it's not going to be the end of the game. Uh, there's many uh, factors, many ESG factors for which we don't have strong disclosure standards yet, for which we're still figuring things out. And some of those scenarios aren't as clear, um, you know, four degree versus one and a half degree warming scenario. Okay, that's a pretty clear thing to model. Uh, but what about the future state of human rights law or the future state of, uh, you know, customer, uh, customer damages like, you know, the Facebook teenage depression? What, how do we model those? Uh, what sort of uncertainties do we face? How do they differ from the European Union to the U.S.? None of that is in the regulations yet, and, and it's pr pretty difficult to put in there. So I think the regulations are always going to establish a floor. And then companies like Engine Number no. One, other asset managers, whether it's BlackRock, State Street, Allianz Bernstein, Parnassus, Morgan Stanley, they're all going to be trying to figure things out above the floor. And so it's good to raise the floor, but there's always a lot of action above it. Well, and, and as you kind of alluded to before, there is, in some of these instances, kind of a time window. Uh, that you need to really see significant action on. And so, you know, I guess the concern I have is, is that are we going to be able to effectively deal with a lot of these issues if we have these time windows really uh, starting to clamp down on us? Well, I think it's, it's a really important observation. And it also highlights a little bit of the limits of ESG investing. Uh, some people think that ESG investing is going to solve all of these problems. It's going to solve the problems of climate change, solve the problems of racial justice. Right. All it's supposed to do is incorporate ESG factors into an investment thesis. If the current policies, the current stakeholder opinions don't lead to that being internalized by shareholders, it's not going to solve the problem. It's only going to make sure we're not leaving stuff out. We may have to go further in terms of pricing carbon, in terms of addressing systemic racism uh, to really have the impact we want on a society. ESG, uh, the ESG initiative and ESG investing more broadly, just about not leaving things out, but it's not about getting things exactly right. So we may still need more policy, more legislation, more regulation uh, to achieve what we want as a society on some of these issues.
So then I guess the question becomes is you, you also have this anti-ESG push that is out there as well, and it plays out a lot in our political discord uh, these days. Uh, I, I think some people would say, let's hope we've kind of reached the peak around anti-ESG. I think there are others that, that would say we're still not at that point yet. Well, we're certainly seeing uh, from the time we launched the ESG initiative to the present, a real surge in this anti-ESG movement. Uh, and it's gaining a lot of power, especially with the new Republican Congress, um, should soon in the next few days uh, be the target of President Biden's first veto, uh, pushing back against the repeal of and the, 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 uh, the allowance uh, to do ESG investing within U.S. pension funds. Uh, and so making sure that funds can do that, can incorporate ESG factors. I think we are getting to the point of, I'm optimistic that we may be at the point of peak anti-ESG, because in recent days, the state of North Dakota, which is not exactly known as a blue state or a bastion of progressivism, uh, nothing against the residents there. My wife's family is from North Dakota. Uh, but, but overall, it's a pretty red state. Their legislature voted 90 to 3 against anti-ESG bills, against bills that would restrict ESG investing. Why? Because they said, why should we, the government, regulate the financial market's ability to incorporate ESG factors? We're not in the business of regulating. We believe in free markets. And it seems like the free markets value ESG. Uh, there's been similar pushback in Indiana, in Kansas, in Wyoming, a number of states. I was talking to uh, representatives in Arizona yesterday about their efforts to push back against the anti-ESG. I think the fact that the business case, the financial models say that there's a there there, the ESG factors are material by the SEC definition. And that the anti-ESG movement is imposing regulation as a solution, it's starting to highlight that this may not actually be about what they claim it is. It may not be about protecting pensioners' value. It may be more about protecting polluters, protecting people who don't care about their workers, uh, or finding a political wedge issue, kind of like critical race theory or transgendered bathrooms that, that resonate with some people, but may not be as big of a problem as we think for society. Uh, and maybe the costs of regulating, the costs of taking certain financial institutions out of the market, as our own Daniel Garrett's research has shown, could be much larger than the political benefits in the short term. At least that's my hope. So for those funds out there that have kind of started to incorporate uh, ESG components uh, in their funds, what kind of growth do you expect that you're going to see? And, and maybe even what's the best way to attract more investors in that world of, of ESG investing? What we're trying to do with the ESG initiative and what the better investors are doing is to build the business case. You know, in some ways, talk less about ESG and talk more about profits, losses, efficiencies, costs, model the cost curves of the energy transition. Uh, look at the unexplained variances on the profits and loss statement and link them to ESG factors, but, but start with the P&L and focus on the P&L, focus on the business case. The more we do that, the more sophisticated we get in looking at the energy transition, in looking at the changing workforce, uh, in, in looking at ESG factors from a business standpoint, the better our investment decisions will be the better the returns on those investment decisions will be and the easier it'll be for you as an investor, whether you're red or blue when you go into the voting box, to say, this just makes good financial sense. I don't want to leave this stuff out. Let's make sure it's in. Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.